So we've made uh, a full 48 hours with only one slide presentation, so I'll, I'll, ta <laughs> I'll take the second one behind Peter Singer. Um, so very informed audience here. I won't, I won't uh, drum on about the history of the Joint Special Operations Command or the community, sort of the evolution starting in the 80s, but the theme of transition uh, that we went through is uh, a subset of everything that's been talked about here over the last two days. Um, so if you, if you consider, consider the way the, the model was created inside of JSOC over its 20-year history pre-9-11, we basically uh, entered the battlefield, and uh, Yanni and I served in uh, similar units during those, those windows, um, st structured like this. You, you, you could argue that it was doing something different, um, and we certainly thought that as we, as we entered the fight, because we were able to move so much faster than traditional systems could uh, in the 80s and 90s. But what we found was, uh, in reality, when we, when we faced a distributed network uh, in Al-Qaeda, the, the, the chinks in the armor became very clear quite quickly. Um, and part of that is our, our thesis around what happens as organizations evolve. As long as you're structured like this, you're, you're, you're prone to create stovepipes, stovepipes between different verticals. That's what allows you to control a large organization. So our problem was, as you, as you pit these two models against each other, a uh, traditional bureaucratic system and a distributed network, if it's symmetric warfare and you're facing a, a similar model, you're both essentially playing the same game albeit your end states are, are radically different. So in retrospect, uh, the way we now look at uh, the, what was happening inside of our bureaucracy was, uh, and the reason they're so appealing for, for large organizations is they're, they're highly reliable, uh, which is ultimately the goal of a, a big system. They're process driven. Processes can, can be refined more and more over time. They're very measurable. So it's a, it's a linear sort of assembly line mindset. They, all those processes inside it can be optimized. And the ultimate goal of this sort of mo model is to create as efficient of a system as you can. And you can tell narratives in any of our previous conflicts around this, this model. How efficiently can I get A to B, create the max amount of X with the minimum amount of Y, however you want to look at it. Meanwhile, the sole focus of, of, a, of a network system is adaptability. And ultimately what we found was adaptability uh, will trump efficiency every time. And the distributed networks of Al Qaeda and what we're now seeing in ISIS, uh, that's in their very nature. They don't do it because they're strategic thinkers uh, necessary along these lines. It's just the nature of a, a network system. And so our finding was the harder a traditional bureaucratic system pushes on that network, the faster it will adapt through the seams that are, that are uh, inherent in the bureaucracy. And so ultimately what we had to become was some sort of um, hybrid system where the strengths of the bureaucratic system could sit in the background. This is how you train soldiers, deploy forces, fix helicopters, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing in industry and government. There's a lot of strength to the, to the power of a, of a grown and healthy bureaucracy. But over top of that, we had to lay, overlay a network system that allowed individuals or nodes to cross traditional boundaries with information, decision rights, uh, moving into other, other folks' battle space, et cetera, which, left, which required a, a decentralization of trust much deeper down into the organization than we'd ever seen before. And the end state was this constantly morphing picture of subnetworks that night over night for years over years were allowed to actually drive uh, what was happening inside the organization. Meanwhile, the overarching strategic uh, and stability came from the, the, the bureaucratic model that sat in the background. So I'll, I'll pause there. So, Yanni, so Chris has described, so JSOC had to become a network to defeat a network as the kind of, uh, I mean, I, I would, it was, can you reflect on that? And also, I guess, you know, the US military is by definition a, you know, a very hierarchical organization. And if you're talking about pushing decision making further down, uh, the kind of further down in the ranks, and somebody makes a mistake in this kind of model, you know, are they treated in the same way uh, that they would be treated in a traditional sort of military bureaucracy? because you're going to have mistakes at a lower level with this kind of model, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and, and I think Chris and I have talked about this a bunch of times that, uh, you know, the, the, the network to defeat a network is not enough in itself. I mean, a lot of the other speakers have talked about 
you know, dealing with Salafists versus Sufis. They talked about dealing with uh, the hearts and minds of the engagement with the local population and, and all those things. But in order to get that space to do that, you needed an enterprise that was focused, narrowly focused, on kill capture of the most radical elements of, 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 the, of that network. So there are other inputs that need to be you know, put in place in order to defeat a network, but, but the way that we approached um, you know, the problem set was to, to create an organization to defeat another specific organization at a time and place you know, at that time. If you, if you look at this and Al-Qaeda in Iraq or the Taliban, whatever, uh, you're, you're, you need to take another step back and say, okay, that was then, this is now. How do we tackle ISIS? How do we tackle different elements of ISIS? The ISIS, as Doug pointed out earlier, uh, that's closest to Baghdad or at Mosul is not the same ISIS that's at Raga. You know, the, the enterprise that goes after this network needs to be created specific for this. Um, yeah, and I'd offer, the, to your point, there, there is risk in this model, but there's risk in moving too slow in a traditional model. Sure. Um, and we, part and parcel of, of running an organization like this comes with pushing down enough information so that if you consider these smallest sort of, albeit just an abstract model, these yellow dots that are out there on the fringe outside of the normal boundaries of the organization, uh, the ultimate goal and where we were able to get to was that it, the model sort of flips on its head. So the traditional bureaucratic system, even the military, of you know, receiving guidance, indexing that against the intelligence as you see it on the ground, going up and asking for permission, then be given that permission and executing. Uh, we had refined that down to as fast and efficient of a model as you could create, but it still was several hours behind the decision curve of the Al-Qaeda network. And so the only way you could get ahead of it was allowing those dots to move before they have permission. And so to do that, you have to push constant strategic understanding into their realm, which means you have access to things that traditionally you wouldn't at that lower level. And you can reach across boundaries into other agencies, into other forces, and say, what, what, I need to know exactly what you're seeing right now because I need to move in the next 20 to 30 minutes. I can't seek approvals. The, the opportunity will be lost by then. So you have to you have assume some, but you, you counter it by ensuring the right strategic information is down at that level. And you also brought other people than the military into the network. Absolutely. I mean, who did you bring in um, as, as the fight against AQI developed? Uh, I mean, first of all, you know, there, there was, um, there's more to just AQI, okay? There, there are other elements that you're, you're combating out there. I mean, there's, a, uh, it's not just um, specific to Iraq, it's, it's more of a, of a global enterprise. So you're actually involving the experts in certain, you know, counter network uh, activities within the U.S. government outside of the U.S. government, uh, within the U.S., and then uh, in, in kind of in the international partners. I think that, uh, uh, that that's something that um, SOCOM has done, you know, uh, uh, bigger than just... But uh, specifically, like, Treasury, FBI... Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you got to go after the money. you got to go after the, uh, uh, the, the, the rat lines of, of people coming in there. You need to go after uh, the, the individual leadership. Uh, you know, uh, after Zarqawi is gone, you know, uh, AQI is a different organization. And, and similarly, you know, bringing it, because this isn't necessarily about yesterday. You know, this isn't the, the network against networks of yesterday. It's about today. And to go after, you know, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, there, there is no caliphate if there is no caliph. Hmm. Uh, so, so you're going to have to target the individuals, the kill capture mission, and you're going to have to target different aspects of the organization to include the money, the, the, the rat lines, and everything else. And in order to do that, the military is not necessarily the, 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 the element that's going to do it. And all of it is based on intelligence, so you obviously need uh, a, a very heavy uh, uh, you know, reliance on that. And some of it is you know, U.S. born, some of it is local. Um, Since this is a policy question, I won't address it to Chris because he's still in the reserves, yeah. but uh, I'll address it to you, Yanni, sure. which is, so this model that, you, that we see up here, yeah. this uh, sort of networked, distributed model, uh, how does that fit with the, what we're actually doing right now against ISIS? Well, I mean, the, the, the natural answer is it doesn't. 
<laughs> and, and, and the fact is that, you know, we, we heard earlier uh, General Odierno mentioning, you know, that we are training brigades to take over Mosul. Is that a good idea? No. I mean, it, we have to train brigades. You have to train the Iraqi army to react in certain ways. But that's not, you know, our, the strength of what we're talking about here. The strength that we're talking about is small units. You know, I mean, you know, if I, if I was king for a day, I would, I would tell you, you know, to, to jump a couple of questions. I, if I was king for a day, I would tell you that, you know, the first thing that you do is you deploy a special operations task force to counter this network. You don't deploy a division headquarters. You don't deploy, you know, uh, a, a, a team, you know, the, the, the airborne strikes. As an Air Force officer, you know, I could tell you, or former Air Force officer, I could tell you that, you know, uh, I've grown up as a strategist thinking that air campaigns are part of a greater air campaign. They're not something of themselves. So the idea of the way that we've approached it is, is quite frankly just poor. I mean, I, I could go sadder than that, but you know, I don't want to be, <laughs> be a real downer here before we get uh, to the question yeah. and answer if, session. If I could s s circle back, uh, avoiding the policy debate. Um, the, but you bring up a, a, a good point, Peter, about um, who, who else is involved. And, and here's what didn't happen in the evolution of this model. There was no 400-page playbook. There wasn't a, a, a RAND study that said, here's what it's going to look like in four years, start building it. Because <laughs> um, it was impossible. There was a mentality that said, this bureaucratic system is too slow. It's not working. So let's start to push the envelope and see what, what unfolds. So the whiteboard was sort of wiped clean, and we were allowed to start from scratch. And then what that allowed you to do, and this is why it took, it took time, was every time you, you encountered a situation where we moved too slow on that, we didn't have the right access on that, we didn't have the right information, you could then go back into the bureaucratic model and say, okay, what was, what's the blocker there? Why can't I get that intel when I need it? Why can't I talk to that battle space owner? Why can't I reach back into DC and ask this question? And then somewhere in that, in that structure, there's an answer. Well, th th there's this regulation around this relationship, here's the memo that says I can't tell you until this happens. And then you can piece those things apart, either solve for them or pull them into the, into the network and say, okay, I'm comfortable with you going point to point with this, this group and solving for that in real time. There's a big difference between where we, you know, accepting your critiques, but I mean, you know, when we were, when you did what you did with JSOC in Iraq, A, we were losing, uh, and losing is a very powerful kind of corrective to previous kinds of forms of, uh, you know, whatever you, need, you, you were doing before wasn't working. Two, you had an exceptional leader, Stan McChrystal, an exceptional, uh, you know, Admiral McRaven as well. Three, um, you know, we had 150,000 American soldiers uh, in the country, and we, you know, we, we really understood what was going on, partly because every night there were 12, you know, 12 raids that you guys were doing. And so, I mean, it's very different right now, right? Mm -hmm. So, looking to the future, uh, we're obviously not going to, sort of replicate uh, anything that we were doing in 2005, 2006. But if you were king for a day, mm -hmm. you, you would advise what? Well, I mean, look, you can't replicate exact things, but I think you know, a lot smarter folks earlier in the day have talked about maybe perhaps repeating themes, not necessarily uh, specifics. So the idea of, of creating a theme of what we're talking about, I, I would recommend that the president, you know, introduces a, uh, a counterterrorism task force that's focused on targeting ISIL, uh, both obviously in Iraq and, Afghan and, 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 and uh, Syria. It, it may be different in, in the way that we tackle it even within Iraq, not just Iraq and Syria, but, but I would absolutely form that. And I would also form a, a, a counterpart to that of soft elements you know, uh, uh, that, that focus on the training and advising of the Iraqi uh, security forces and or other forces that go the other way. The notion of deploying, again, division headquarters, brigades, or even the talk about a large footprint uh, force of U.S. forces going in there is, is to me, intellectually numbing. Okay, so, so, I mean, this is something that needs to be absolutely, you know, uh, you know, countering violent extremism is one thing. That's one conference that was had. You know, one, another conference that needs to be had is how do we tackle this this way? And it doesn't, mm -hmm. it won't take long to really come up with the starting blocks. You know, the decision uh, needs to be taken though. 
you know, history may not repeat, repeat itself, but it, sometimes it rhymes. And yeah, so, exactly. Um, yeah. So what is rhyming right now, uh, Chris, for you, when you uh, look at AQI, and, which is the parent organization of ISIS, how are they, how are they similar and how are they different? Well, I think the, the obvious one that jumps out, I'm sure everyone in the room, is uh, similar individuals. I mean, there are key folks inside uh, ISIS that, that were born and bred and, 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 and grew up inside of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, and in some ways, I, you know, you can look at it as a, as, a, as a disease where, you know, that the part of the disease that survives the antibiotic re regimen is going to come back stronger. It, mm. it, it's learned. It knows, it knows some of this. It knows, you know, better operate. It knows how to engage with the population better than AQI did. It's demonstrating that. Um, so there's a lot of lessons there at the individual level, which is now going to make it that much more impressive. And I think it's, um, it's also learned how to communicate with the world much more effectively, um, which equals its, its rapid go growth compared to, to AQI. Uh, so, I mean, I, you seem to imply that if we kill Baghdadi, that would be the end of it. No, it's, it's not just the end of it, but it's a good start. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is you have to remove, I think, the caliph, but you also have to remove the caliphate. But the, when we killed Zakawi, the violence in, uh, in Iraq actually started going up. Well, look, I mean, we can even use the statistics of, of earlier speakers. I mean, sir, you mentioned, you know, violence is going down, uh, you know, in history. So uh, the fact of the matter is that there, we, it was not enough, and that's my yeah. point, to just kill Zarqawi. You have to actually dismantle the network. And the same way that, you know, ISIS has... Uh, economic aspects to it. They, they have social aspects to it. They have, you know, they're providing services. Uh, it, you know, the fact that they're, they're recruiting mentally handicapped children to go and, and be suicide bombers is not what it necessarily is attracting recruits to come in from Europe or Morocco or anywhere else. There are other aspects of the movement, you know, that are attractive enough to bring them in there. Uh, Both of you spent many years away yeah. from your families fighting al-Qaeda in Iraq. You yeah. basically, they, they looked like they were totally defeated in 2010, yeah. right? So were you surprised or what's, what's your reaction to their comeback? It's not even a comeback, it's uh, they're bigger and better. Uh, no, I wasn't um, really surprised. It's dis disappointing, of course, um, but you know, given it's, it's an ideology, as we all know, um, and that there are remnants of it. You, know, you can't completely destroy it. But enough pressure was removed that they were able to, again, find the cracks in the, in the tradi traditional system. In this place, it was uh, land area that they could start to control and grow inside of. I mean, it makes, it makes total sense. Um, you know, I, I, as we were talking about earlier, in some, in some ways, I love, love the analogy. It's like a, an endless Rubik's Cube that you're never really going to find a solution in there, but you don't want to put it down. You have to keep keep playing with it, looking for the for the end state. Otherwise, um, it's going to get away from you really really fast. I, I'll tell you. First of all, I mean, this is a you know a sixty four thousand dollar question because the the truth of the matter is that um, you know we may want to leave on arbitrary timelines, but the the the, the enterprise is not necessarily over because <laughs> of the, uh, the the timeline that we're putting in there. Same can be said in Afghanistan. You know, two thousand sixteen, we're going to have we're going to be out by whatever. You know, that doesn't mean that the, the, that is going to be over. And, and, and similarly, you know, uh, earlier Emma mentioned, you know, the, the, the re one of the real reasons why there's such a mess in, 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 in Iraq is because we went there in the first place. You know, so, so the concept, I mean, one of my favorite uh, quotes to kind of uh, get into H.R. Uh, um, uh, McMaster's use the fear, honor, and interest from the Peloponnesian War. I mean, the, you know, your, your empire may be dangerous to take, but, you know, it's even more dangerous to let it go. And I think mm -hmm. the fact that we're stepping away from some of these things is perhaps the more, the bigger tragedy well, that raises going sort of in a, there in the first that place. That raises a bigger sort of philosophical question, which is, you know, we, the United States, were born sort of in a, you know, a revolt against an empire. We don't think of ourselves in an empire, but these projects, by their nature, are not one or two year deals, right? Right. I mean, so I mean philosophical questions go to him. <laughs> now, no, you're right. I mean, that's, that's exactly the point. The point is that this is, you know, when you're talking about generational fights, it doesn't mean that, you know, well, you know, let's declare victory over this particular thing. The son of ISIS is perhaps more dangerous than ISIS. Mm -hmm. The son of AQI is perhaps more dangerous, uh, uh, you know, than, than AQI itself. The fact that on the foreign terrorist organization list, we list ISIL, parenthesis, uh, remnants of AQI is, you know, it's, it's a bit telling in itself, you know? We don't know how to treat ISIL. It's graduated far beyond 
uh, AQI, but it still has certain AQI characteristics. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is a long-term event. Um, the, the force, you can't close down a base like Baghdad or Balad or whatever, lock up the stuff and say, okay, we don't need to, you know, use that anymore. Uh, a shift, a pivot to Asia immediately after we get out of Iraq. I mean, what, where... You know, I'll take wrong decision for a thousand, Alex. You know, I mean, we're, 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 yeah, uh, so. Uh, well, on that, um, if audience members, if we wait for a mic, we'll take Heather Halbert right there in the back. And then Harlan, all the H's. Thanks, I'm Heather Halbert from New America, and I've got two questions for you both about the network over bureaucratic overlay. You can imagine, as Peter, your question alluded to, this would be a fabulous model potentially for cyber command. You can even imagine it as a fabulous model for humanitarian response on the civilian side of the house. Given how challenging it was for you even within JSOC, can you even imagine doing this in other parts of government and what are the things that would make it possible or impossible? Second question, one of the big reasons JSOC was able to do this is the tremendous amount of trust and legitimacy that it has um, on the Hill and with the American people. Given that our oversight structures, I think it might be generous to call them an efficient bureaucracy, what kind of oversight do you create for a network overlay like this so that it continues to enjoy the level of trust and legitimacy that you benefited from? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take the first question. Um, yes, absolutely, I think it can happen in any system. Uh, it's not easy. Um, but uh, I've seen it branch out into, into other parts of government and other parts of the military and have done work in, in other spaces. We're seeing large organizations to try to pick up some of these, these characteristics and it's very doable. Uh, there's a process to how you do this. It's not, this isn't Facebook. This isn't just Twittering back and forth. It's, it's a legitimate process and how do you structure an overarching strategic intent you have to have the right type of leadership that's bought into delivering that and being, rather than at the top of the, the org chart, as Anne Marie said earlier, pulling themselves down into the middle and creating the network around them, and they become the commun communication flow, the hub, rather than the, than the approval point for decisions. Um, it's, a, it's a different model, but it's very doable if you have that clear understanding and, and you're willing to put the systems in place to, to execute those, those communications. I mean, that's, that's a great answer. Um, Tom Briggs? Hi, Tom Ricks. Uh, just as a follow-up on that for Chris, what, what did you do with people who simply were unable to adjust to the new system? And what percent of overall JSOC personnel would you say that was? And JSOC leaders especially. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I, would, I would say the vast majority were able to uh, adopt this way of thinking, um, but it's a, you know, it's a certain selected type of <laughs> folk. Um, but I've seen it adapt in other systems that don't have you know, triple, quadruple selection processes to get there. So I think it's very, um, folks can assume this model. Um, well, Chris, the, uh, specifically, like where, where, where have you seen it successfully adapted? Uh, I don't want to give you my pitch. Okay. We, we do this in industries. So, yeah, but uh, like give yeah. us an example because it's interesting. Um, so we've, we've, we've done it with companies in, in technology and in, in banking and cons consumer goods. I mean, everyone's wrestling with some version of this model this problem set, which is things move exceptionally more fast on the outside than, than my, the model that I built in the 80s and 90s was designed to pass information and, and make decisions against. So, so how do I handle this? Um, so, but to your, to your questions, the, the majority of folks um, adopted it in any system. The, the hardest part is gonna be at that, that mid-level, because we've all come up through bureaucracies at some level probably in our lives. Here, you're executing against the known. You're, you're, you're the action person. Here, you're setting the strategy. Here, your, your incentive, your existence is all about managing the control levers that allow information to flow up and down. So when you start to offer you know, a, a center out leadership model, the people that are they're, they're incentivized to control that information flow, they're the hardest ones to convince, hey, this, this, there's an, this works for everyone, but I need you to, you, most importantly, that you break your mentality around being the, being the gate of information flow. So that's usually the hardest part. I, I, if I can add that, you know, um, 
I know we're putting the, the label of a particular command on this, but the, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, neither one of us speak for the place and, you know, we're, we're just speaking of our experiences. And I would tell you that from my experiences, Tom, um, that uh, that enterprise was very much bottom up in terms of actually listening to people and actually listening to uh, innovation coming from, from the ranks. But at the same time, it was very much a well-led organization that embraced this sort of culture. So in a way, resistance is futile as, as the, the end goal, you know, the conclusion, but it wasn't because it was forced. It was because it was well-led, so people bought into it, but at the same time, it was the type of people that you're dealing with that, that were actually not just embracing that, they were accelerating it, you know, if I, if I can put it that way. Holland, Ruben, over here. We should have a special Harlan Ullman mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. I'd like to ask you, can you really elevate a tactical solution to a strategic one in this yes. context? Let me, let me finish the question. <laughs> I, I thought um, I'd get away with it quickly. <laughs> um, and you have to help me here. Yeah. I don't understand how the United States and the coalition are organized to take on the Islamic State. Uh, who in the White House has been assigned various authorities and responsibilities? Among the coalition of 62 and 20, aside from working groups, how is that being organized with authorities and responsibilities? On the U.S. side, you've got at least four combatant commands engaged, fifth if you include the CIA. You've got General Terry, who's in charge of the ground game, and John Allen, who's got some kind of role in here. So when you see this whole structure, how would you apply your construct to dealing with the Islamic State in a really rational way that's going to work? If I, I guess, yeah, I, I, yeah um, I mean, it actually is an exactly the same answer to Tom Rex's point, you know? The only way that this can work is if you have a well-led enterprise that is adaptive, that is supported by groups of individuals that are actually embracing this sort of tactic, you know, or approach, and then, and then you have to move forward with it. If you don't have that, you know, any one of those variables, then, you know, this is a theoretical discussion. But I have to tell you, you know, this isn't nice. This is kill, capture, brutal attack of a network in, in its totality, okay? This is actually telling them that you're not going to meet the 72 virgins, you're gonna meet the 72 Virginians. You know, this is, this is not going after them in a way that, you know, uh, you, you, the, the tweets that are going to come out after this are not going to be nice tweets. They're going to be, you know, maybe, it, all, all over time, maybe you don't want to take your family to Raga because they have kind of a nice system. You know, it's a bad thing. But I'll tell you, the alternative, what's going on now, on now is not that nice either. You know, we say that the coalition has driven ISIS out of Kobani. You know, click Vice News, you know, or CNN or anything like that, and you see Kobani, and it looks like Dresden. You know, is this a solution? You know, it's, it may be, you know, some, some kind of antiseptic to, 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 to just watch it from a video game of plink, 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 and things go boom. But, but what, what is left on the ground, I mean, how are we going to rebuild that? Is that the, the birthing place of the next... ISIS kind of fight. I mean, this is a really, uh, you know, vast, you know, sort of thing to grasp in, 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 in the context and the grand nature of this, but this is, is very specific. I mean, you have to have a leader and you have to have, you know, the, 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 the will to do this. Other questions? I would offer, there was a, there was a distinct clarity around mission in, in, in Iraq where, um, there's a broad strategic intent to create a stable state. The subset of that that gets pushed down to the Joint Special Operations Command is defeat Al-Qaeda. Because if you don't do that, I know I can't do all these other things. So then around that, we can build all these subsets. Um, with, if we hadn't had that clarity of intent, uh, we certainly could have created as much chaos on the battlefield as we were solving for. The Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy up in Boston. And I think what you talk about the U.S. government did a lot of successful things, specifically with the task force and reaching back in the government. 
and bringing those capabilities forward of CIA, FBI, and others. How do you connect uh, foreign elements to the network? How do you bring the network back down to the ground level? And how would you propose doing it with Sunni communities in Iraq and Syria? Because I think if you build this network with ISF, you're not going to really have the results you need. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you um, the at the center of the strategy was actually, um, you know, the rule of law and actually doing things with almost the evidentiary kind of uh, a level uh, where you can actually take things and eventually the idea is to have some sort of prosecutions after, uh, you know, out, out of these, the people that you're, you're picking up. This isn't, when you're capturing them, it's to lead to more captures, so there's an intelligence value to it, but there's also a, an element of they are, they have done something very poorly, you know, or, or illegal, so you're putting them in jail. Um, so, so there's an element of that, that the FBI was a, an absolute critical element of it. Um, so the, I mean, look, at the end of the day, you are dealing with our rule of law versus their rule of law. Okay, so, so we have to have the rule of law as a, as a, as a critical entity in the countering this, this, this scourge. Um, so it has to be a, a, a critical part of it. Uh, yeah, I agree, totally agree. Any other questions? Just over here. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Ben Hernandez, Naval History and Heritage Command. ISIS has evolved from AQI. Now they hold territory. They control millions of people, and they have to provide services for those people. They have to do things like be concerned about holding main supply routes from Syria into their capital city. How can we exploit that? That smells like they're becoming more of bureaucracy. Hmm. No, I, I, it certainly could become their new reality. I mean, in and, and, and many ways, that's, that's a good thing, right? If they, if they have a po population that's now dependent on them and they, they expect potholes to be filled and schools to be open, then they will get mired down in the same problem that everyone else faces. Um, they've, they, they've made some moves toward that, but my, my two cents is that's just to ingratiate the population at that point, this point. I don't think they've taken it on as a serious part of their overarching strategy or, or see it as a real requirement yet. But, but they may at some point. Um, that said, um, that could be a, that's a timeline on, on, on their terms. So it's a, not necessarily the most aggressive way to focus the problem. But I think they have also have a capacity issue. I mean, it's one thing to, like, you know, Mosul is, whether it's 1.5 or 2 million or whatever the number is, I mean, you know, that is a big city that's three times the size of Washington, D.C., which itself has its own problems, even though it's not run by ISIS. But uh, so the point is there's a lot to, con you know, so it's a lot to deliver. If that's the goal. Well, I mean, look, you know, yeah, I mean, we can mix it up rather a lot if we start talking about Mosul and, and Raga, because I mean, even those are sort of different entities. But but I would I would I would take it out for a second and just say, okay, Hezbollah, Hamas, you know, they they, I, I'm not against you know anybody necessarily becoming a political party or, or, or you know, Sinn Féin representing the IRA or anything like that. I, I really care, almost cursed, I really care yeah. about the fact that their behavior is such that is absolutely unacceptable. The, the, their tactics are unacceptable. If they embrace different tactics, then they fit in different categories. It's kind of like picture Tombstone, you know, the movie. Okay, at one point, if they let go of that sash, I don't care where they go, okay? But as long as they have that, you know, and they're behaving in a particular way, they're gonna die. There's no two ways about it, at least in this model, you know? So that's my take, sorry. Thank you. Um, both Chris and Yanni are two of the most exceptional officers of that generation, and it's been really a pleasure to have them on the stage. It's an Thank honor. you. Thank you.